scripts and in movies and all of that, when it comes to the female superheroes, do you know what one of the things they all have in common? They're all really good looking. <laughs> have you noticed that? Wonder Woman. Beautiful. Captain Marvel. Gorgeous. They're all very, very pretty. But it's not just superheroes. Actually, if you go and read your Bible, you'll never believe what you find. Sarah, the wife of Abraham, was so good looking, he was worried when he went to Egypt that somebody would kill him just so they could have her. Rachel, really good looking. Rebecca, very good looking. Esther, wow, good looking. All of them are so good looking. Read your Bible, I'm telling you. It's almost like you could, you could have, instead of in the beginning, you could start the Bible with this phrase, all the women are strong, all the men are good looking, and all the children are above average. <laughs> oh wait, that's like, woe be gone, never mind. But yeah, all of, the, all of the female heroes in the Bible, all of the female superheroes in our world, they're all really good looking, but... Here's the thing, that one of the, the great sages of our time said this, there must be more to life than being really, really, really ridiculously good looking. Zoolander, you're wondering. Look him up, it's okay. And there is, in fact the Bible has something to say about that. Now don't let anybody get, but get upset, I'm quoting Solomon, he might have known what he was talking about. He had 700 wives, maybe he knows. Solomon said this in Proverbs, A beautiful woman without understanding, without wisdom, is like putting a gold ring in a hog's nose. So guess how many, when you go back and you look in the original languages, how many of those really, really beautiful women in the Bible, how many are called also really wise? One. Now it doesn't mean the other ones are foolish, but as far as the best looking women in the Bible, there was one who was both good looking and incredibly wise. Anybody know her name? Hey, it's right up there. All right. <laughs> Abigail. And you know the weird thing about Abigail? She is everything. She is, she is a perfect hero. She is very good looking. And for the Bible, that's a good thing for the female heroes. Very good looking. And she's very wise, which means the Proverb 11.22 that says that you want, well, basically, if you read it, back, if you read it the other direction, you want, a good, you want a woman who is beautiful on the outside and incredibly wise on the inside. That is the goal. That is the absolute apex. And there's only one. But yet, how many mentions does she get? She's truly unsung hero in the Bible. Well, let's go ahead and look at, at, at part of her story. Does anybody know the Abigail story? I, I knew somebody would. Good. Thank you, Maria. It's in 1 Samuel 25. We're going to start with verse 23. There you are. When Abigail saw David, she made haste and alighted from, from her ass and fell before David on, on her face and bowed to the ground. She fell at his feet and said, Upon me, my Lord, be the guilt. Pray, let your handmaid speak to your, in your ears and hear the words of your handmaid. Let not my Lord regard this ill-natured fellow Nabal. For as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name and folly is with him. But I, your handmaid, did not see the young men of my Lord, whom you sent. Now then, my Lord, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, seeing the Lord has restrained you from blood guilt, and from taking vengeance with your own hand, now let your enemies and those who seek to do evil to my Lord be as Nabal. But now let this present which your servant has brought to my Lord be given to the young men who follow my Lord. Pray forgive the trespass of your handmaid. 
For the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house, because my Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord. The evil shall not be found in you as long as you live. If men rise up to pursue you and to seek your life, the life of my Lord shall be bound in a bundle of life, in the care of the Lord your God. And the lives of your enemies shall be, shall be slung out as from the hollow of a sling. Then when the Lord has done to my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you, and has appointed you as prince over Israel, my Lord shall have no cause of grief or pangs of conscience, for having shed blood without cause, or for my Lord taking vengeance himself. And when the Lord has dealt well with my Lord, then remember your handmaid. And David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who sent you this day to meet me. Blessed be your discretion, and blessed be you who have kept me this day from blood guilt and from avenging myself with my own hands. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I probably ought to give you a little story context on this one, right? Because you're like, oh, Nick usually tells us the story. Okay, I'll tell you the story. Hold on. So, David, David is out there, and he is in the midst of having to flee from Saul. Saul's trying to kill him, Saul the king of Israel. David's been anointed king by Samuel, but he doesn't get to be king because Saul is still king, and Saul's trying to kill him. This is not a good combination, right? But, not only, but now that we have this happen, we get to chapter 25 for Samuel, and of all things... Samuel, the man who anointed David, the man who was teaching David how he should go, dies. That's not good. And David, in the meantime, while he's out there fleeing from Saul, he decides to help out a man named Nabal, who's a very wealthy farmer. And he protects his flocks, he keeps any raiders from getting things, and then he goes to Nabal and he sends his young men to say, hey, could you give us some of your food since you're gleaning your sheep or you're, you're shearing your sheep and you're going to have festival? Could you give us some of what you've got? Wanting a little bit of, well, wanting a little bit of pay for helping. And Nabal sends them away and tells them he's, he's giving them nothing. And David is enraged. David is going to stand up. He's going to, you know what? I have a right to get paid. I have a right to receive what, what is owed to me and to my men, and he's about to do something pretty rash. He's going to kill Nabal and all the men on the farm. That's, that's pretty rash, right? Nobody's on board with this, what David's going to do, I hope. So Abigail sees what, she saw what happened. She heard about what the reception her husband failed to give to David looked like. And she grabbed as much food as she could, grabbed, put them on her donkey, and went out as quick as she could to stop David from doing something impulsive and rash. And she gave that food to David's men to give them what they were owed. And she speaks to David this word that we just read and tells David, hold up, wait a minute, David. But is she, at no point does she say, no, David, you're wrong. She didn't say that. In fact, she, she makes fun of her husband in a pretty awful way. She said, you know, his name is Nabal, and that is what he is. Let me give you the English equivalent. Imagine, ladies, for a moment, your husband's name is Dimwit. And you say, well, don't kill Dimwit, because he is absolutely a Dimwit. He, he is the dimmest bulb on the ranch, Okay? And, he, and he's going to get what is coming to him. She doesn't say that Nabal is innocent. She doesn't say that David isn't right to be angry. He is right to be angry. And Nabal is an idiot. Absolutely. And I don't say that, I don't say that uh, lightly. It's literally his name. Okay? Abigail is doing something for David, and verse 26 is the key verse. We won't go back and read it, but what Abigail does in verse 26 
is she saves David from doing something he should not do. And there are two elements to what it is David should not do. One is incur blood guilt. Now why would he incur blood guilt? Nabal did wrong. Yeah, but what about all the rest of his men? David going and wiping out every male on the farm is not going to be proper payment for one man doing the wrong thing. Plus, David is not supposed to be shedding, is not shedding the blood of Israelites. If you look in the rest of that story, he never kills an Israelite in all of 1 Samuel. Even when he kills Uriah, he's not even an Israelite, but we won't get there. That's for like 2 Samuel. We'll preach that one day too. But David doesn't kill Israelites and he's about to. Because even as annoying as Nabal is, even as foolish as Nabal is, he is a descendant of Caleb, one of the great and amazing Israelites of the past. And David shouldn't incur blood guilt by killing him and especially by killing his men. So she saves him from, doing, from incurring blood guilt. But the other thing, and probably the most important of them, is this. She saves him from saving himself. See, David has been called by God. When Saul became king, he became king because he was head and shoulders taller than everybody else. And everybody said, well, that guy looks like a king, right? He's taller than everybody. And he was made king because he was powerful and he was tall. He looked right. But David was the, was the forgotten son of a, of a guy named Jesse who when he was told to go call all of your sons, forgot to call David. Has anybody been that youngest child? Sorry, Mom. Uh, <laughs> But he was the forgotten son and God called him from watching the sheep and said, you will be the shepherd over my people Israel. And not because David was stronger, not because David was taller, but because David was a man after God's own heart and God would win the victory. Now how important is this story? Those of you who took a Bible study class with Blossom and I where we talked about inductive Bible study, we, we taught you a, a word called inclusio. I don't expect you to remember it. But that's where you have one story above and one story below that are very much, the, they're very much similar. And then the story in the middle is the meat of the sandwich. When you talk about a sandwich, what's the most important part? Does anybody say bread? Then you must eat candy corn because I don't... What's the most important part of the hamburger? The meat! You can put it on sesame seed bun, you can put it on a Hawaiian roll, you can put it on lettuce if you want to. It's fine, but the meat is the point. So what are the two stories that surround this story? Both of them have to do with David not saving himself. The first story is in chapter 24. David and his men have escaped, they're escaping Saul, and they went into a cave to hide. And then Saul, by himself, walks into the cave. Perfect target, right? David has every opportunity now to take out the guy who's trying to kill him. He has the opportunity, he has the, he has the means, he has the motive. But he's convicted by God, don't do it. You're not supposed to win the victory this way. And so he spares Saul's life. Cuts off a little piece of his robe and then when Saul's out of the cave, he comes out and he says, hey Saul, I was right there. See, I don't, I'm not your enemy. Okay, then we, have, then we have chapter 26 which follows after our story. Chapter 26, Saul is after David again and trying to get him. And so David and Abishai, one of the mighty men, they sneak into Saul's camp and they're all sleeping so soundly nobody sees them coming. They come up to Saul, he's on the ground, his spear is right by their side and Abishai goes to David and says, hey, hey David, um, can I grab that spear because I can pin him to the ground real easy. 
Literally what it says, I will pin him to the ground as though he was collecting insects. I pin him to the ground. All That's all we got to do and then you're free. And David says no. Now in between, now the difference between those two things, the in-between story between those two things of showing David restraint, the meat of this particular restraint sandwich of not acting upon your rights but acting upon what is right for God and allowing God to defend you instead of you defending yourself. The meat of that sandwich is our story. The story of a hero, an absolute hero named Abigail who does not save David from chariots and horsemen. She does not save David from enemies trying to sneak up on him. She saves David from himself. She comes up and she is a woman of understanding. And the verse, verse 3 of our chapter is where it talks about her being very, very good looking and a woman of understanding. Like I said, awesome combo. She saves David from incurring blood guilt. She saves David from claiming his own victory instead of trusting in God. But she's a forgotten hero. Now, by the way, she's really clever. I, I just want to tell you that. Now, I know that you've all missed me telling you Hebrew words, right? Well, we're about to give you one. The first word is shifcha. Can you say it? So that one's hard, right? The second is Abba. You can say that one. There you go. Now, shifcha is a word that's translated handmaiden, and what it means basically is your servant, your servant girl. It's the person who would bring you water. It's the person who will bring your stuff. It's the person probably in the story with, when it comes to Jesus washing the disciples' feet, probably the person who would have washed their feet if things were done properly. That's shivcha. Ama is also translated as handmaiden, but it means a servant girl who is available for marriage. Do you know what word that Abigail uses nine times out of ten in the story? Ama. You know what David does after Nabal dies? He marries that girl. It's like she was planting a seed. She's kind of clever that way, right? She becomes the wife of David. Now that means she's got to be important, right? Go read Matthew. Go read Luke. Go read the genealogy of Jesus. Is she there? Nope. Go read the rest of the Old Testament. You will find out she had a son. Was he ever a candidate to be king? Nope. She is an unsung hero. She is told, she is celebrated in chapter 25 of 1 Samuel. She is absolutely celebrated. And then she is all but forgotten in the rest of the Bible. Man, talk about your unsung heroes. But she's absolutely a hero. She saves David from his worst impulses. She does what needs to be done, and we know that later in David's life, he won't be saved from his worst impulses when it comes to Bathsheba. So you could say Abigail is kind of the un-Bathsheba story. But a woman of understanding, a woman who gets what needs to be done and when. Because that's the thing about Abigail is she saw immediately what had to be done, and she stepped in to do it. We got anybody in here like that? I know we do. Another, another woman of the Bible is not so unsung, this one's very sung, is Mary, the mother of Jesus. They're at this wedding. Those of you who watch the, who watch the Chosen, you've seen this recently. They're at this wedding. They're out of wine, and she's a woman who knows what to do. Right? She goes up to him. She, she says, hey, go, go talk to my son. Do whatever he tells you to do. That doesn't mean she's doing it. I mean, Abigail did, didn't physically restrain David. And Mary doesn't physically do, do the things that Jesus was going to do. But she says, hey, go talk to this person. I bet some of us can do that, can't we? We may not know exactly what to do when someone is struggling, but we know exactly who they ought to talk to, don't we? 
The other one, I love this one, and somebody mentioned this on the Facebook post that we had about Unsung Heroes, is, my, is, is little girl named Miriam. So Moses is put into a basket, sent down the River Nile. Now there are alligators on the River Nile, or crocodiles on the River Nile. It's not a safe place to put a baby. But she puts the baby in the basket, and Miriam, without anybody telling her to, she follows the basket all the way. And then when Pharaoh's daughter finds the basket, she goes up to Pharaoh's daughter and goes, Hey, I know a, the perfect Israelite woman who would help you take care of this baby. Let me go call my mom. And so Moses' own mother gets to take care of Moses as a baby, even though she had to give him up for a moment because of the wisdom and the quick action of Miriam. We have those women in our midst. We have those women here today in this church who are women of wisdom and who know what to do and when. And I celebrate you today. You are heroes. You are beautiful and wise like Abigail. And I hope some of us men can get a little bit close. But if you are a person of wisdom, if you are a person, whether you are a, a woman or a man, if you are a person of, of wisdom who understands what to do and when, and you can come and help even your pastor to know, hey, uh, you ought to go do this, we celebrate you and we thank you. But more importantly, there are a lot of people in our world today who are walking in darkness, who are walking without having any idea what they ought to do. If God has given you wisdom and God has told you, now, go talk to that person, then I encourage you to do it. Because like Abigail, she didn't hesitate. She got on her donkey and immediately went to go and take care of the problem. If you are in contact with anyone in this city, in your life, in your family, and you can give them some of God's wisdom, you can give them some of God's light, then like our friend Abigail, don't hesitate. You may be an unsung hero, but an unsung hero is still a hero. And we have a lot of them here today. Please pray with me. Father God, I believe this church is filled with people who are beautiful in your sight, who are wise in your way. I ask God that those who have received light from you and who have understanding of what needs to be done and when, that God, you will also give them to the courage to saddle up their donkey and ride down to wherever they need to go to share your wisdom with those who are walking around not knowing what to do. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you'll.